Sir Ben Kingsley doesn't so much immerse himself in his roles as disappear into them entirely. Starring in Richard Attenborough's Gandhi, he stunned the world with his Oscar-winning portrayal of the Indian spiritual leader. In Schindler's List, he embodied the emotional core of Steven Spielberg's film as the accountant Itzhak Stern. More recently, he's played comedy in The Wackness, haunted cinema goers in Martin Scorsese's Shutter Island, and strapped himself into Mike Newell's blockbuster ride, The Prince of Persia. Born Krishna Banji, his most famous creation, of course, is himself, the great actor Sir Ben Kingsley. How did you get into this all-consuming business of yours, acting? Was it really that little Italian film, I think it was called Never Take No for an Answer, about the little boy and his donkey, and you looked exactly like the little boy, Papino? Well, Martin Scorsese recently gave me a DVD of, of the film, yeah. uh, and so I watched it again, uh, and I was totally moved by it, and it is like watching an old black-and-white photograph of me come to life. I, as a child, looked very like the little boy in um, Never Take No For An Answer. What really made you really love that film so much? I empathised with the child a great deal. I mean, I was a totally sentimental child mm -hmm. and had to be carried out screaming from Bambi. And this, this little boy and his, his wonderful odyssey really appealed to me. And I think it was such a, a beautifully made film and the motives behind the making of it were so unsensationalist. Mm -hmm. And it was an honest, um, tender look at post-war Europe yes. and a tiny part of post-war Italy yeah. where this boy had lost everything during World War II. And was there anything else which really drew you into the profession? Uh, that, that really compelled me to be um, in a film of some kind. Mm. So I, I imagined that my every movement and gesture was followed by an invisible camera crew. <laughs> uh, so I was the star of my own film. Mm. And as I grew into my early adolescence, my early teens, I realized that I was very good at impersonations. Um, and then my, and I, I believe we, we have a tendency perhaps to live up to our nicknames. Mm -hmm. And my father dubbed me the Danny Kay of the family. And, uh, and I watched his films with great joy. Uh, and to be dubbed the Danny Kay of the family was quite glorious. And then many years later, I was able to tell Danny this story. And he was delighted because at the premiere of Gandhi, uh, he was the um, ambassador for UNESCO. Mm -hmm. And he accompanied Richard Attenborough and I to yeah. every premiere. And he was glorious company, and I finally got to sit with, eat with, be cooked for by Danny Kay. Didn't you have a terrible uh, audition uh, at, in, for the theatre when you had a different name? No, it was for RADA, and I auditioned for RADA under my birth name of Krishna Banji. Mm -hmm. My handwriting was rather poor, and it was translated onto the uh, call sheet the clipboard of the gentleman mm. looking after us very nervous audition folk. And he was reading through the names and I was waiting nervously and he read Miss Christina Blange. Miss Christina Blange. I thought, oh God, that's me. <laughs> that's me. Because he'd misread. It's yeah. quite easy. If you look at the, if you write it and look at it, it can be very easily read <laughs> as Christina Blange. Yeah. I then, then, of course, had all the, the wind knocked out of my sails <laughs> unintentionally by this lovely chap and did a rather mediocre audition. But everything happens for a reason, Derek. I then did another audition and, and secured a theatre job, my first theatre job, within a matter of months. Really? Yeah. Well, you did an awful lot of theatre before you really went into films in yeah. a big way. So I suppose the big one was, of course, Gandhi. Yes. And I remember visiting you on the set. Yes. Were you surprised to get the part, or did you think, well, I, I really do fit it? I'll tell you a very strange story. That um, about three weeks before Richard Attenborough phoned me at the stage door of the Aldwych Theatre, I was in a very demanding play. I was disappearing into it. It was not very fulfilling, although it was a very fine production. 
And uh, in order to escape the tedium, I'm sorry to put it like that, of these performances, I decided to read a book. Mm. And it was the pain illustrated biography of the life of Mahatma Gandhi. Mm. I then had the phone call from Richard Attenborough. He invited me to his beautiful house and um, he said, darling, uh, what do you know about um, the Mahatma? And I said, sir, I know quite a lot because I happen to be reading a book on his life right now. And he thought for a while and then said, well, of course you are. Because he also was being bombarded by these gentle, life-affirming coincidences. Mm. Things were falling into place. And it was Michael Attenborough, Richard's son, who loves Shakespeare, is a great theatre director, who happened to be in the audience when I played Hamlet. And it was he who told his father, Dad, if you ever get the money, I think I've found the chap who should play. Really? Mm -hmm. Lord Gandhi, yes. <laughs> What the hell is going on? I don't know, sir. The agent got a telegram, and it just said he is coming. He gave the time of the train. Who the hell is he? I don't know, sir. My name is Gandhi, Mohandas K. Gandhi. Well, whoever you are, we don't want you here. I suggest you get back on that train before it leaves. They seem to want me. I believe non-cooperation with evil is a duty and that British rule of India is evil. I want to document coldly, rationally, what is being done here. If we obtain our freedom by murder and bloodshed, I want no part of it. I'll never assimilate that many eccentricities, idiosyncrasies, oddities, purities. Mm. Um, that, I, I, he was an extraordinarily eccentric creature and very, very well documented. Mm. Miles of film of him mm. and, and all India radio voice recordings yeah. and BBC recordings. So I could listen to him and I could, I could watch him on film. Mm. Dickie was tremendously supportive. I lost weight. And um, by the time we'd started filming, I think I was less frightened. And then, of course, by the time Attenborough says action, you just can't be frightened. You just, mm. you just have to dive in. Mm. Uh, and, I, uh, and I dove in, and, 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 and there it was. Were you surprised at the great success you had? Or did you suspect by the end of the film that you'd really done your best work? I had nothing to compare it to. But what, what I think made it the unique experience for me and for others that it was, is that we didn't have any CGI. Mm. Every single living, breathing creature on the screen is a passionately enthusiastic Indian extra mm. who is thrilled at seeing him again and recreating this wonderful moment in their history so that when they wanted 100,000 people to listen to a speech of mine, they were there. So that was extraordinary for me. So all the applause you got for your performance yeah. and the Academy Award and everything, did you find it difficult to deal with all that fame and fortune suddenly? I think that a lot of people, understandably, didn't realise that that performance was a result of 15 years of, uh, of classical training no, in the theatre. No, And they, they, I think they thought that Diggy found me in, in, a, in a takeaway. Mm. Um, and probably thought, well, that's a one-off, it's great. But the, what, what saved my bacon, I think, was Sam Spiegel, almost the same time that Gandhi opened, mm -hmm. allowing me to open in Betrayal with Jeremy and Patricia. And Betrayal actually opened the day that I received my nomination for Gandhi. Uh -huh. And a, a, a wonderful journalist said, Pause a bit, because it might have been you. Um, ben Kingsley's performance in Betrayal has just earned him an, an Academy Award as Gandhi, because then people realised he's Harold Pinter, middle class, mm. <laughs> quite different. But you did have a little space uh, not long after 
Gandhi, when you've always said you didn't do your best work or maybe the films weren't terribly wonderful mm. and you thought, well, where mm. am I going from here? Absolutely. What, what made you feel you can really do as well again as you did? It was an opportunity. Um, certainly in, in the late 80s, mm. when I was asked to portray uh, Simon Wiesenthal, Yes. for that beautiful HBO film. And that really put me back together again. Yes. And then there was a, a little hiatus, and shortly after that, in, in, the, uh, in 1990, uh, Warren Beatty yes. was producing Bugsy, and I had a wonderful meeting with Warren and Barry Levinson, and mm. that's when I really began, as Maya Lansky, mm. my more mainstream and uh, that, that earned me, miraculously, my second nomination. Mm -hmm. I was thrilled. Um, but it also um, endeared me towards Annette and Warren and, and uh, Barry Levinson and all the wonderful people working in Hollywood. And then that led to a, a whole wonderful spate of, mm -hmm. of work in, in the United States, getting acquainted with the writer of Schindler's List, Stephen Zalian, doing a lovely film called Searching for Bobby for Show for Him. And then from Stephen Zalian's film, I then was in Schindler's List. I've been talking to Gert. I know the destination. These are the evacuation orders. I have to help organize the ship and just put myself on the last train. That's not what I was going to say. I made Gert promise me he'll put in a good word for you. Nothing bad is going to happen to you there. You'll receive special treatment. The directives coming in from Berlin mention special treatment more and more often. I'd like to think that's not what you mean. Preferential treatment, all right? Do we have to invent a whole new language? I think so. How did you model that, the, the part of the clerk? Because it became an, a really important part of the film. And it might not have been under, with another actor, but I think you made it a very important part of the film. I owe an enormous debt to some of the great individuals that I've met during my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, Simon Wiesenthal and I, we got very close. Mm -hmm. And he is a Holocaust survivor of enormous stature. And just spending time with Simon and portraying him and his struggle for justice and remembrance mm -hmm. gave me, um, empowered me and, and helped me hold my nerve with Steven Spielberg, who's also, mm -hmm. in his own way, another... Talmudic prophet, mm -hmm. um, and yeah. he'd, he'd recreated something absolutely Must have been a pretty hard shoot. It was very hard. It took me a year to recover. Really? Yeah. And what did you do after a year then? I mean, did you do anything between in that year? Or maybe I did was, you just rest? I was exhausted. I was um, not in a good state emotionally. It, it took a long time to shake off that massive amount of grief. I could have got more. Ask her, there are 1,100 people who are alive because of you. Look at them. If I made more money, <laughs> I threw away so much money. <laughs> you have no idea. If I just. There will be generations because of what you did. I didn't do enough. You did so much. The next major event, film after Schindler's List, was um, Roman Polanski's Death in the Maiden with Sigourney Weaver. Yes, Lever. another pretty <laughs> so, part. So I was tied up and tortured <laughs> yes, yes, in that yes. film, but at least it was by Sigourney, who's delightful. And well, that was another success for you. And then, uh, not long after, I suppose, came Sexy Beast. That was another great success for you. And a surprise, I think. I mean, uh, you had played some pretty vicious parts, but this was the most vicious part you've ever played, isn't it? Wasn't it? Oh, yes. Yes. And how did you manage to do that? You'd played Gandhi, you'd played the Clark in Singer's List, you'd played all sorts of heroes. Yeah. But then, <laughs> this horrible man. Oh, because I was in Peter Brook's Midsummer Night's Dream, mm -hmm. the famous one. Yes. And um, I remember whilst directing me, he said, because he was onto something, and he was right. And I'll never forget this, and it works for cinema, it works as a, as a maxim for life. He said, what do you think about your character? 
I said, I think he's a little shallow and silly. Whoa, 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 he said. There's always something in the character that you are portraying mm -hmm. that is greater, more magnificent, more profound than anything you could muster. Think again. And I went back to the character and I thought, you know, he takes enormous physical risks for love. He goes into a dark forest and fights people and demons and emerges wiser and truly in love. I w I've never done anything like that. Peter's right. Mm. I'm treating this chap like a silly adolescent and in fact there's something absolutely magnificent about him. Mm. Now it's hard to find something magnificent other than the scale of his rage in Don Logan. But what I did discover, and it made the script and the characterization consistent for me, was that Don Logan was most definitely, in my eyes, an abused child. An abused child who had uh, not been healed mm -hmm. and who would go on classically to abuse others. Mm. And this is a classic symptom of, of the unhealed abused child. And as soon as I embraced my Don and said, I know, Don, I know, mm -hmm. I know. It was awful what they did to you. Mm. Come on, let's get on with it. Mm. Then Don and I were friends and I cared for him because <laughs> I knew why he was screaming. I knew why he was abusive and violent and everything fell into place. I hope you didn't live that part for a year. Or no, months. no, I, <laughs> I, I, the wonderful thing when things are going really well and I'm strong and capable of handling it, is I can walk away from the set exhausted. Mm. I have left everything on film. Yeah. I've left everything in the set. I've expressed fully mm. my day's work and I go home exhausted and I sleep like a baby. That's the best way to leave the set. Now let's get to uh, The House of Sand and Fog, which you got a nomination for, I mm. think. I did. Uh, tell me about that film. The House of Sand and Fog was, um, was just a, a, an extraordinary invasion of my consciousness because the writer of the book, Andre Dubu III, uh, sent through his wife the manuscript of the book to me way before it was a film. Really? Mm -hmm. And his wife said in the letter, my husband has based the character of Colonel Barani in his book on you. Mm -hmm. So I ended up acting Colonel Barani from a novel that was based upon me a character that was based upon me in the novel in the first place. I loved the man very much. I loved playing him. It remains a very treasured experience for me. It was um, an extraordinary microscopic look at a tiny, tiny little circle in which lived this family in this house. But it's so much the American experience. Many Americans were, were very affected by it, mm. particularly men, and particularly men with sons. Welcome to Shutter Island. You are hereby required to surrender your firearms. We are duly appointed federal marshals. But during your stay, you will obey protocol. We take only the most dangerous, damaged patients, ones no other hospital can manage. These are all violent defenders, right? They've hurt people, murdered them in some cases. In almost all cases, yes. We try to provide them with a measure of calm. Personally, Doctor, I'd have to say screw their sense of calm. You made him English, or you insisted, or you didn't insist. I didn't you insist. Asked. I, I very politely asked Mr. Scorsese English, yes. if he would consider my character being English. Yes, was the answer immediately. And he didn't even ask me why. I wanted to be completely undisguised, so that I didn't want to be talking to people on the set mm. in one voice and then on action doing a false voice to Leo. Because the film examines many things. It, it examines male vulnerability in a beautiful way, as does um, Elegy with Penelope Cruz. And in both cases, I asked the director, please, can I play him English? Because it means that there's one less layer between me and my fellow actors. Mm -hmm. There's one less layer between me and the camera me and the sound man, me and my character, mm -hmm. let him be dangerously close to my rhythms of speech and patterns. Uh. What's more, you read the book again, in 10 years it'll change again because you've changed. 
Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I've always been vulnerable to female beauty. Miss Castilla was different. Her posture was perfect, and she dressed like a young associate of a prestigious law firm. There was a sophistication that set her apart. She knows she's beautiful, but she's not yet sure what to do with her beauty. At all, no, don't take notes, because honestly, it's not worth it. It really, don't, don't give it a thought. Do you think you're going to do better I, as comedy? I hope, I hope I have more opportunities. Um, because one or two of your comedy films have not given you much of a script to play with, even though you've played very well with it. But Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't um, think you've done your best as a comedy. I'm sure there's I, something I, in I, there. I'd, I'd, love, I'd, love to, I'd love to try more. Uh, it, it's rather like, though, it's, I suppose it's the reverse of somebody who's famous for making people laugh, mm. playing a straight role, and people in the audience are going, uh, 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 waiting to laugh. But mm. he's not doing anything funny. Yeah. Mm. But they just so anticipate that yes, that yeah. turn of the head means laugh. It doesn't. Um, so in the same way that perhaps I'm more perceived as a dramatic player, yes. hmm. people can't quite believe it that I'm actually being funny. And I, honestly, Derek, I think I am, but it's just <laughs> that it's so surprising for people. Hmm. Um, a role I found very liberating was the Wackness. I oh. really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. That mad psychiatrist who was completely addicted to pot and... Yes, and, uh, yes. I mm. really enjoyed that. And, that yeah. was, um, and it was a tiny film, but it did give me uh, an opportunity to really go a little messy and crazy. And Because a lot of my characters um, depend a great deal upon their self-control. They depend upon their own dignity mm. or their own uh, controlling their own power. They are rather, I don't mean this in, in, a, in an anal sort of sense, but they are, they demand a careful performance. In the whackness, uh, I, it was possible for me to be careless, mm. uh, blurry, mm -hmm. just, you know, just, you know, mm. just mm. let it go. I really enjoyed that. I'd love to do some more comedy. I don't get to lie on the couch or nothing. Would you like to lie on the couch? Is that a trick question? What's the deal with you and my stepdad? We're friends, I guess. My life sucks. Has this got something to do with Kurt Cobain? What about the Prince of Persia, Mike Newell's film? Did you enjoy doing that? I did very much. Now, it's, it's a Disney film produced by Jerry Brockheimer, who's the genius of family entertainment and the king of family entertainment. And what Mike did uh, through the filming process, through the script editing process, and through the final film editing process was insist, 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 and maybe he fought battles, I don't know. Mm. But my goodness, he turned a plot-driven, mm. action-driven film into a character-driven story. Mm. He won't get out of the city. I'm sure he already has. My part is a man who embodies envy and regret. He saved his brother's life and he yeah. curses himself ever since because his brother was older and was the heir to the throne. Mm -hmm. And if my character playing God at that opportune moment <laughs> had allowed his brother to die instead of saving his yeah. life, which was the decent thing to do, which he did, he, would, he, you know, he, he lost the throne. That gesture of kindness towards his brother lost him the throne, and he never got over it. So apart from Gandhi, which I suppose you would say is the best part you've ever done in the cinema, who knows? Is there a part which you say, now there, if you were dropped dead and went up to heaven and said, well, how do you justify yourself? And you said, I justify myself with this part. It's, it's impossible. Yeah. It's impossible to choose. Mm. I love Elegy, I love The House of Sand and Fog, I, I, I love Sexy Beast, Gandhi, Schindler's List. They're, they're, really, I've been very, very blessed. I, um, I must be doing something right. Mm.